Good afternoon. I am Gregory Washington, the president of George Mason University. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to Russia's war on Ukraine in a historical perspective. Our Russian and Eurasian studies program developed this 12 part series as part of a course Mason faculty are teaching on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The goal of this series is to present the work of 12 scholars and writers from around the world. Their insights help us to understand the historical relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the invasion itself, and the remarkable resistance of the Ukrainian people. Through the perspective of these historians, we are better able to comprehend the war in Ukraine in a broader context. This series is an illustration of how humanities research in a public research university can create knowledge, spur discussion, and expand understanding of complex global issues. We appreciate your viewership of this series, and we are proud that George Mason University can bring it to you. Enjoy. Well, thank you, President Washington. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm Professor Steve Barnes of George Mason University. Uh, in addition to today's, today's speaker, I'm joined by Jessica Dotrieve, a PhD candidate in US history, safely back in New Orleans now after a Canadian rendezvous with Hurricane Fiona last week. I want to welcome you to the fourth in our ongoing series. You're here each Monday as part of my online history class, History 388, Russia's War on Ukraine in Historical Perspective. A quick program note, due to the teaching schedule of our next speaker, Professor Marcy Shore, we will start at 3.30 p.m. next Monday only instead of our usual 3 p.m. As I put it in our first session together, I want to bring you in on the process by which I have tried to make sense of this war since February. I'm not sure anybody has contributed more to that effort than today's guest, Stephen Siegel, who has worked literally around the clock to document the war and those who comment and write about the war and to share his own thoughts through his enormous Twitter presence. It was following him in February that convinced me Twitter could be not only useful but indeed critical to understanding the war. He's shown us how a careful scholarly approach filled with empathy and a deep moral center can make social media useful rather than toxic. These events are all made possible due to support from the program in Russian and Eurasian Studies, the Department of History and Art History, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, all parts of our George Mason University community. We're trying to build an online discussion of the events in this series on Twitter and invite you to use the hashtag RWOU for Russia's war on Ukraine to share your reactions to any of our speakers and explore my Twitter feed with that hashtag to find links to some of the readings and films assigned in this course, including a terrific piece by today's speaker. To further the discussion, we're also hosting a series, Russia's War on Ukraine and Its Consequences for the World, a weekly Q&A. That's on Fridays at 3 p.m. Eastern. We had nearly 80 people join Professor Cynthia Hooper of Holy Cross and myself last Friday for our first in-depth conversation about the war. It is online, free, and open to the public. Each week of late seems momentous in the development of the war. This past week saw not only Putin's speech on the claimed but unreal annexation of Ukrainian territory, a speech that today's guest called a jailer's rant and psychopathic history that was, quote, half pretext and the other half bullshit weaponized myths. The classic propaganda speech was followed by an astroturfed rally of bust in forced participation that tried to hide the exodus across borders of probably over 300,000 Russians seeking to avoid mobilization. More importantly, for the outcome of the war has been continued Ukrainian victories on the battlefield. Over the weekend in Lehman, where perhaps as many as 5,000 Russian soldiers were surrounded, and in the last day north of Kherson. 
Again, it is all a reminder at a moment when an organization like CPAC posts and then quickly deletes pro-Russian propaganda, or that Elon Musk tweets half-considered nonsense, that we must continue to support Ukraine and to make that support loud and public so that our political system in the U.S. does not veer in the wrong direction because we didn't tell our politicians and our communities what we think. With that in mind, I plan this coming Saturday, October 8th, to attend the Stand with Ukraine Every Day rally in Lafayette Square by the White House in Washington, D.C. And if you are in the D.C. area, I want to invite you to come and join me. Let's turn out a big crowd. Right now, it looks like the gathering will be at 2 p.m. on Saturday, but Jessica is going to give you a link where you can confirm the time when it's decided later this week. If you'll come, please go to the RSVP form that I've created. I'd like to see how many people we can turn out from this audience. Please look for me if you come. Please put perhaps hashtag RWOU on your sign so we can find each other. But most of all, just please come. If you're not in the DC area, or even if you are, there are other ways to show your support. Our guest today has provided us with a link to info and resources gathered by the University of Texas, along with places that you can make donations to support Ukraine and Ukrainians. Jessica will share that in the chat. So with all that prelude, let me turn to today's speaker. Professor Steven Siegel is professor of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of three books, including most recently, Map Men, Transnational Lives and Deaths of Geographers in the Making of East Central Europe. Check out also his interviews of scholars with nearly 90 episodes on East and Central European history on the New Books Network. Among the accolades that makes Professor Siegel proudest is his 2022 Social Media Activist Award from the Association for the Study of Nationalities. Please submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature on Zoom, and I'll ask as many as I'm able after Professor Siegel finishes. And with that, Stephen, I'll turn to you. Well, thank you, Steve, for that very kind introduction and for the invitation today. Um, greetings to all of you from Austin, and uh, my thanks uh, to the audience for following me. And if you haven't, I, I hope you do, um, because what I'm going to do today here is, is really, um, in addition to swearing, which Steve has already done for me, um, I'm going to add an emotional layer to the scholarship and to the research, and, and certainly we can um, have sober questions afterwards. On the night of February 23rd, 24th, I thought about fear. At first, it had less to do with Russia's war on Ukraine. It was more about life. In social media, as in flattened maps, life has an odd way of being reduced. Nations get unduly labeled by ethnicity and nationality with east-west gradients, bold immovable lines, geopolitics into red-blue states and red lines, conflicts that come in two dimensions. Erasures of humans, mixed regions like Galicia or Donbass, oversimplified with histories of settlement and development. The violence is what drags us in, gives us supply. I stoked it too, like a fire that breathes. Until a retreat, <clears throat> pushed toward an unconscious side, recoiling into the private, making excuses, enveloped. Victims of Russian violence know that there is a clear aggressor. Wars and revolutions are such catalyzing political events because they don't have no choice options. Monocausal narratives. What started 1914? We consult dull textbooks or build straw men like the end of history to find something to talk about to pigeonhole inconvenient generational change. I still don't really buy the argument that all history pivots around a 9-11 or 1989 or 1968, the Holocaust or world wars, they have different starting dates, or 1848. Historiography of East European nations lacks consensus. Wars don't end. Trauma becomes a tool for nuance. All empires and regimes get defeated. Here on October 3rd today, the Ukrainians will win. 
This is objectively true, but I can't prove it. Which is to say, the history of a better Europe is pinned on Ukraine in 2022, as it was in 2014 or 2004, a profound wish for liberty, victory, justice, and a future over fear. My unorthodox take on Ukraine today is a raw map of time, the unfixed category that cartographers hate. It takes form amorphously as a reflection in three parts. One, on pacing, the biorhythms of echo-chambered communities of artists and professionals that don't speak to each other. Two, on tactics, the work of performing digital activists as opposed to just plain activists. And three, on reservoirs of feeling, across a spectrum and in contemporary Ukrainian studies. The last one is literary and most complicated. Why aspiring or accomplished academics connect to the people we connect to? Why we don't leave our topics? Why networks of privilege grow stale? Why we who teach don't listen? The February 24th archive is a poem opened and polyphonic. It represents my hope for digital toolship physical allyship, and real ideology-crossing friendship. In appealing for global solidarity, Ukrainians are the guiding stars, and it's not a matter of choosing one war or nation state over another. This is our moment of no pasaran. Ukrainian journalists have every global and local right to be angry, to assign blame to perpetrators and deniers. Their worlds are of resistance. What I mobilize, governed not by Kremlin BS history, but by choices, hopefully with ethics. Therein lies the intersection of history and geography, maps with time. I believe in our actions for multi allied solidarity in Ukrainian studies, the field that has existed since the 1970s, maybe the 1670s, if you read Sahi Plohi. We are there for all those who look. Citizens must move bodies and our bodies must hold criminals accountable from behind their screens and long tables. On the late night of February 23rd, I was in Austin working a new job. My partner was abroad taking care of a parent terminally ill with cancer. I wanted to be there. That restless night in Texas, I saw snow and ice, which if you remember the growing annals of Republican catastrophe had threatened the infrastructure grid in 2021 and left people stranded and freezing in their homes. That was America. So I couldn't do only Ukraine. My countries of research were transnational and multiple and I had other private concerns. My ancient Swedish dog, my victory dog, pushing 13 and a half was ill and making a diuretic mess in my flat all through the night, TMI. He was responding to my trauma and worry. I'd vowed to take him to the vet at dawn, ice on the windows, no scraper, unprepared, cold, colder. At which point during the first four hours of the invasion, I opened my car sometime, I don't remember when, and backed into a standing concrete white pole, running late on no sleep. Panic. I just checked on an old friend in Kyiv who recorded her dulcet voice for me, singing Ukrainian folk songs. She prayed. She hoped I would play them if no charms worked. The missiles lighted up the cities from the darkened, unprotected skies. More terror. My brave Texas grad student from Dnipropetrovsk, already displaced with his family once in 2014, twittered at me. A few hours earlier, I think around four, he wrote, I'm literally shaking. He and I had been on a panel a week earlier in which there was still talk of off ramps for Putin. For me on Twitter, I knew it would be an archive of raw emotion. Day one or day two. Plenty of threads by rational analysts couldn't disguise this. I watched open source intelligence accounts. I read analysts like Michael Kaufman who was right but had overestimated the power of the Russian military all the same. 
I saw the entire intelligence landscape changed. And I feared the worst. I'd seen defense and amateur mappers cover troop movements. I watched the so-called special operation develop on the Belarusian border for months. I myself was trolled, even watched. My bike was stolen in Texas, my office broken into. Eventually, I would see 18 and 19 year olds thrown to their deaths or who got captured as POWs. I didn't and don't share photos or videos as per the Geneva Convention. I'd exchanged hundreds of messages with friends who asked if they should flee in Ukraine to villages and dachas out of cities. I put out words in my feed like dictatorship, war crimes, genocide. I hashtagged. And ultimately, I told my grad student to tell his parents that it would be shock and awe on a scale of the US attacks on Baghdad, our war criminals. This would be Putin's lifetime, lifelong sadistic wish, a multi-prong and multi-city in my quotes invasion. It was planned, mapped, and telegraphed, this coup, as the Washington Post reported later. I noted that airports and strategic infrastructure would be hit first through the weeks that followed. I urged him, my grad student, to tell his mom and dad in Dnipro to take shelter immediately. Not that I wanted to be right. I'd been in the field of Ukrainian studies for over 20 years. I wrote three books in 2012, 13, and 18, each of which dealt significantly with Ukrainian historians and geographers, some of whom were executed. When I went into Twitter in 2018 and podcasting in 2019, I featured amazing book authors, but I'll be honest, I went online to do some pundit and pretender policing. I swapped tones, developed masks and registers. I slept very little. It was stress, fear and trauma, chaos, contingency, hypocrisy. Worst of all, I saw academics of every stripe suddenly fall silent or fail lie detector tests. Some messaged me privately offering to help and I carry that mental list because I know who took risks. I admired ones who resisted the urge to make everything more complex. I disliked the safety seekers. One voice should say, dear public, this war is fucking wrong. I don't care, I'm against it. I support protesters. I don't need to win every argument. It's not about my ego. I know what's wrong. Those are not Nazis. Those are Nazis. Goebbels goons, here's why we need Ukraine, like Alessia Kramechuk wrote about. Here are limits to human humility and empathy, as Professor Cynthia Hooper discussed weeks ago in a brilliant talk. Our friends are in danger. Help us help them. Help us keep a society and prosecute those who deserved to be damned. On February 24th, the royal we, the humanistic West, failed. We can talk about Russian gumanistica and the risks of protest, but history was hijacked by Putin, who, in case it needs repeating, is not a historian. Here was a 9-11 or 11-9 or November 22nd or August 6th or 9th, but it somehow felt out of time. Putin was the aggressor, a bully and a killer. Everything Russia and Putin fought against an imagined enemy, collabor collaborators and enablers worldwide and in Ukraine too, should be shown. The places called Odessa, Lviv, Kherson, Kharkiv, and Kiev sang. I tweeted their songs as counterweapons, Chervona Kalina, Eurovision, fierce resistance. Who were the names of the 20 million displaced persons, victims of Bucha and Izum, before, I was simply in Ukrainian Jewish studies and the history of science. Now, I'm still outnumbered by a Russo-centric scholarly industry with limits to its compassion. One former advisor who was not Pat Herlihy, my mentor, told me I'd commit career suicide by choosing to study Ukraine and Belarus instead of Russia or the Soviet Union. I'd seen colleagues move quietly away from ACES and increasingly into ASN, the Association for the Study of Nationalities. 
And let's say Stephen Cohen was a reason, but more a symptom than a cause. He'd been a good historian once, but to my mind, had become a caricature, a CNN-loving, nation-loving, Chomsky-like egomaniac, maybe he didn't love CNN, who didn't know Ukrainian or visit Ukraine. He, of a senior generation, did basically nothing to help those of us who were young, Ukraine-adjacent scholars, transnationals, queer people, minorities, and women in the profession. Yes, there's a scholarship, but I just needed to say this. I'm not Ukrainian, unless you count my labors of love. I'm a non-ethnic partisan of Ukraine, a Ukrainophile, a book prize chair, a teacher, and a student. We have to know our translators and poets by trade. We quietly compile our own lists of experts through AAUS, Hury, the Shevchenko Society, and other guild type organizations. The fact that many of us supported Ukrainian defense makes us sort of outcasts. I'm on the board of H Ukraine, and as Alessia pointed out from London, it created a kind of double personal and professional consciousness where what we said was not always what we did. Let's write. What did it really entail to crowdfund a drone or to create five new positions for 5,000 displaced Ukrainian academics and writers? Could we confess this? Did deans care? Whose prestige were we really adding to? Yale, Princeton, UT Austin. Did Harvard need us? Who paid us from the giant sucking sound centers in New York for our extra time? diligence and traumas. Our colleagues slept peacefully through the blitzkrieg, the targeted February assassination attempt against Zelensky and his circle. Grad students like John Shesteczka and Kim Varnin picked up the slack. And I watched. Russia's war of aggression immediately rendered us hawkish right-wingers, Boris Johnsonists, Nazi apologists, Pentagon and NATO shills, Azov apologists, ideological outcasts, leftists who could not communicate with leftists while all the same being accused of being Ukrainian neo-fascists. At first, none of this was fair, but I think we've won anyway. In terms of digital worlds, there are limits to activism. We activists began repairing the hearts that Putin ripped to shreds. We expose to you, the public, the tendrils of our Ukrainian history, all the genocides and death, the sedimented layers to our lives. These geographies of emotion, the transnational micro worlds, the I in the they, the stories of stories. Call it maps of time or time contingent prejudice, why we love our friends and colleagues. Where corpses rot, and sirens sound and scales are out of whack. To my mind, 2022 academics in Germany and Russia and American Russianist academics were preoccupied with losing their status and careers, white collar jobs, children's tuitions, comfortable late tenured lives. While Ukrainians lost their lives, families, flats and jobs, this absolutely enraged me. I posted this letter, which I'll read from a Ukrainian academic friend in Kharkiv where I'd worked in summer 2019 and taught NGOs and students from over 10 countries. It went viral and I watched the reactions. I tweeted and as I tweeted, I tore up what was left of my patients. I put it out on Twitter at 4.21 AM on March 4th, 2022. And my colleagues said this, the Russian army from Kharkiv cleans Ukrainian cities off the face of the earth, destroying key infrastructure so that there is no water, light, heat. Rescuers can't dismantle the debris under the shelling. The Russian army is squeezing the civilians out of the cities so that they can then fight the rest as if they are terrorists. Yesterday, many of my Kharkiv residents became refugees, this is what happens in life. Just yesterday, you were finishing an article and making plans for your vacation. And today, you are standing with a bag at the station in Poltava, a good city I've been trying to see a long time ago, with your scared children and a cat in a carrier. I didn't have time to drive in to pick up my mother, no gasoline, traffic jams and debris everywhere, burned cars, and again, shelling. 
And there is a chance to start your life with a clean leaf, but you are somehow not very happy about it. What's on my mind today? What is more terrifying than the destruction of my country? By the request of a nuclear button maniac will be a new world in which such crimes remain unpunished. The defeat of Hitler's Germany and the trial of Nazi criminals have created confidence in several generations of Europeans that there is a global moral order in which evil is punishable. But for justice to prevail, a military defeat of the criminal regime is necessary. And there are problems with that in the nuclear era. So as soon as the maniac has a remission period, Western politicians will sit with him again at a very long table. This is and will be the collapse of the world order, the real end of history. The thought of my children and grandchildren having to live in this world of evil conquering makes me physically sick." Unquote. Our brilliant colleagues in Ukraine were losing homes, families, livelihoods. My catastrophes didn't match, not one bit in scale. I know this. I reacted to their horrors. My response through this seven months is to do it justice, to go aggressively academic for them if I have to, defend the profession and Ukraine experts who know Ukrainian and Russian for that matter at every chance I could. I wanted my archive to be a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk without the anti-Semitism or proto-fascism, a work of art. I spotlighted Ukrainian voices, poems, songs, paintings, lectures, speeches, forms of resistance, memes, charitable organizations. I collected solidarity statements from some 100 organizations and institutions with the indefatigable basis president, Matthias Neumann. We, by the way, there's nothing that I'm doing here alone. Um, we did this with a lot of help using what networks and tools we had available. The American Historical Association and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum were two of the first actually to put out statements and then came others. I used Twitter, I guess, because it was the best tool available. It was fast. I called in podcasting favors and connections, a reach in the millions, I've hit 10 million at the height, both a pandemic project and my attempt to reset academic life away from old, boring, insular, comfortable places like Facebook into more daring public facing environments. I admired and still deeply admire what professors like Steve Barnes in the early 2000 teens had done, like with his Russian history blog. To more pain, despite this mental health, I said, yes. To all digital activists here today who should take care of their mental health, I will say, when you find the time, use the tools you have before you. GIS, ArcGIS, Story Maps, Python, R, Gephi, Web, Quarter, you name, Web Recorder, and you name it. Learn them in development workshops and labs. I had come to Twitter late, but I liked it. It built momentum. It helped me deal with fearing Trump. It helped me learn algorithms, posting maps first for niche clicks, trying to build my following. All of this worked only insofar as I got in a rhythm. I got the hang of it through the course of BLM protests in 2020 when I was in California, all the timing and trolling and harassment, all very real and counter trolling too. For all my querying of epistemic injustice and defense of the anti-colonial, post-colonial and decolonial, I felt I needed to listen more to black feminist activists and BIPOC scholars. I came to a modest defense of others in our ACs field in 2020 and 2021 as a labor and queer studies activist. People across the profession were getting fired, literally purged our experts from tenure track and tenured positions during COVID. And this happened away from the R1s in liberal colleges that began using the pandemic as cynical pretext. As 
all this as if by accident happened, it was before the February archive giving me momentum and giving me hope now for 222 days. Let me read now a kind of then and now statement. So this is what I originally had posted in New Fascism Syllabus, and some of you um, Professor Barnes students have read it. Um, I, it was posted on March 24th, 2022, and I'll just read a part of it. One month into the invasion, escalated. Since it began over a month ago, I've gotten letters, candles, chocolate, books, clippings, postcards, a blue yellow dog collar, buttons, ribbons, offers to walk my dog, offers to sit my dog, thousands of DMs, emails, insistent tweets to RT, many farms of trolls, food and emojis, gift certificates and cleaning supplies. This is so moving, bless you, but you ought to know I don't want anything. Please and thank you. Make it stop. That's all. Give us back our unpunctuated sleep. I'm in Texas in 2022, another land of despotism. Yes, I want world politics to be resolved for the better. In my quixotry, it should be said, I'm privileged and safe, relatively speaking. I wake up tilting in North America at 1.30 a.m. in support, and I'm back to bed by 4 a.m. for a few hours anyway. My dog sleeps. If the Kremlin wants me, it'll get me. In the darkness on February 24th, I had tried to set historical tone. I don't know what was in my mind on Twitter exactly as I began tweeting. I had a plan to mobilize and connect by the scholarly hundreds, then by thousands in the streets. I thought of recording protest. I know George Mason has done this very well using ethical tools for lived history, not likes because who cares, in the living past, a sense of long, knowledgeable causation, in rewind, or as Marcy Shore calls it, in loops. Drafts backward, correcting drafts, warnings of 1939, of 1914, drawing from Polish Solidarność in 1980, 81, Prague in 1968, Belarusian women in labor strikes of August 2020, Mustafa Nayem in November 2013, Likestone Count, Tahrir, Eurasian color revolutions. Messaging for, I worry about being a propagandist for causes I don't believe in. Career suicide too. From modern America into the worlds we've ruined since 1898 or 1619, I'm imbricated because I, we dare to call out evil. Revise revisions by dialogue, not pretext. Peppered with Arendt, reviewing Grossman and Ringelblum. Elitism, sadly. Hoping to modulate in middles to defend cultures against colonial aggression. Therefore, I tweet. And I message in a way that takes Twitter's toggles to other generationally inflected platforms. I tweet for transnational decolonial Ukrainian studies to share language registers, invoke choice, aid accountability and responsibility on behalf of those in silence and fear. Because it's emotional, February 24th is a limit experience, a new scale of violence. 1941 and 1939 transposed to Cold War 1962. Forget 1997, the Crimson Hearing, Mariupol in 2022, to Aleppo, Grozny, Yemen, Guatemala, El Salvador, Chile, Guernica. More loosely, a kind of Noah's Ark, a biblical time, two by two, side by each, rescued from Ukraine. Atrocity journalists taken hostage in panic disfigured bodies under rubble, targeted schools, and I'll add kindergartens, distant geopoliticians from DC, more great power man pomposity, power flattering Siloviki from Moscow, future denizens of The Hague. Oligarchs, yachts and jets, cross-border prisoners of war, I'm adamant that these not be shown, dogs, cats, bunnies, roosters, and llamas. 
children in hospitals, future painters, sliders down metros, blown up churches and mosques, blocked trains, crowded stations, rabbis, unpretentious, wasted taxes, tractors pulling tanks, jokes and blood-soaked memes, more despair, flowers and fields of grain poisoned, profanity unleashed by the brightest fucking minds, voters and survivors dead, scraps of donated Nazi metal Z junk, near nuclear disaster, radiation, sunflowers, grain, water, soil. Here, I emphasize the pain of Ukrainians. I can't dismiss the portentous shame of Muscovites, but theirs is not enough. New Yorkers who don't leave the island, who choose not to set foot in sacrifice zones. Lots everywhere is lost. Don't pick on me to pick a fight. I convey messages to resistors. I'm a labor and queer studies advocate. I broker trust in concentric fragmented communities. Into the thaw of 2022, I wish I could send the basics of food, water, clothing, and electricity. Ukrainian open air horrors, Russian torture chambers. Now, I would say, thankfully, the journalists have, have covered this very, very courageously. I wish I could save hostages and prisoners or else stop tanks, the crematoria, from rolling. It's true, but there is one psychopath who can stop this from his bunker to the jet yet unclaimed dumping grounds. They don't have the power of ministers to close the skies. Businessmen are like czars far away. I push record until I can't. I'm a professor and a historian of space. I live and die by geography. As an academic at a pivotal moment, I see the potential for us to do incredible point plotted inspiring work. Who among us will make policy, master digital tools, write to journalists and diplomats, become the best of protesting activists, gather funds, build archives, info, maps, data, intel, are years of expertise to seek to assist the victims of unspeakable horrors, illuminate writers and diarists, Turn off the sirens that will haunt our children's memories. Hold spontaneous concerts, share, anthologize, pay for violins, dance, accordions, sound systems, pianos. Give refugees education, home, and health. Have memory, get out of capital comforts, bubbles, cities. Know which words are useless babble in rubble. Study languages. Focus on the marginalized, the names, too. In the summer of 2019, I listened attentively to my NGO students in Kharkiv, where my colleague taught the one whose letter I wrote, I read. A pooling of inspired minds for future Ukraine. Before COVID-19, we held this in common. We loved a place and an experience. As I stopped talking, I listened to the dreams that were drawn from Ukrainian literature and history. It was a turning point in my life. I have long studied countries, Poland, Lithuania, that are wiped away. In this respect, I'm optimistic. I refuse to bid farewell to lands and times shared by 44 million people in Ukraine. My students, peers, and I share a wound. We will mourn this unprovoked trauma outside words and screens. We haven't lost each other. We are united by voice. Tweets or no tweets, shrieking out our rage and grief. Please don't ever forget the grief as I continue my archive. Coda, if you wanna do something, reach out to us. From March until now, October, 
I've sought to reach out to what I would call five communities or groups and build bridges between them. And I'll just mention who they are. First, the professionally trained field experts in Ukrainian studies invited to this lecture series in language, literature, poetry, history, policy, culture. They should have prominence, Ukrainians as well as non-Ukrainians. Two, interested non-specialists from the grad level to full professors. So just some to mention, Razum for Ukraine, Science for Ukraine, Ukrainian Scholar Crisis Group, and there are many others. Three, and I think this is exceptionally important, journalists who are working around the clock, and I literally mean around the clock, it's important for, for me tweeting to get their attention as soon as they wake up. They have no time. The best of them have ethics and experience. The best of them catalog war crimes know what it means to interview witnesses of death and atrocity. They help to build portals. And I think this is exceptionally important that they are not sitting as academics in a comfortable place. Many of them are on the front. For diplomats and policymakers, it's a challenge just to get their attention. I'm in Texas, but before this I had been in Colorado and rural Colorado was a difficult place to get the attention of these people. So this involves using the skills of social media, mastering mood, cadence and timing. Fifth, a voting citizenry. This I would argue is the most important thing as elections are impending. To become more literate about Ukraine, Ukraine and Russia, Ukraine and Russia in the relation with each other. A voting citizenry should be able to use tools, open source intelligence, to read as much as possible, especially if it's not hidden behind paywalls, and we should make those things available. I point to these five groups because social media polarizes. I've tried to make the February 24th archive not only into an emotional project, but really governed by a simple idea that the power of democracy and the plurality of voice is more strong, is stronger than dictatorship. Multiple voices, I think, have been the key. I think democracies are stronger that way, like, say, in Václav Havel's Civic Forum. The truth will out not just protesting with signs up or down as a matter of performance, but actually doing something, putting a body out on a street to protest. I build multi-allied communities and I'll be looking for volunteers for this archive. I would urge our audience not simply to rely on big names or textbooks. Often they do not support people in these smaller solidarity communities, and that is very evident on Twitter. Know the importance as digital activists of saving and digitizing sources because they vanish. Um, the Center for Urban History in Lviv is doing this. Sucho, Saving Ukrainian Culture Online, Quinn Dombrowski is doing this. I think this is an exceptionally urgent and important task. So let me conclude. Digital activists rely on spontaneous accidental interconnections. Strangers, good ones, not just the trolls and vampires hiding behind anonymous accounts. My name is on all of my social media profiles and it's intentionally so. You can follow me on Twitter for the voices I've amplified. I believe that academics are experts and they are most urgently needed now. We will write and learn tools, but it's much harder to develop a knack for social media. I recognize that not everyone wants to do this, especially to be awake from 1 to 4 a.m. for 222 days. Journalists are better at this. Post-Cold War assumptions have been tested and they know it. As for academics, we are not really sure what to do. We don't even know if it's useful anymore to call our institutes Russian. 
These are debates. But I do know that we must do outreach better to incorporate decolonial scholarship, exchange, and event planning, to get out of priesthoods of intelligentsias, to know the limits of the social and the civic, and as Cynthia pointed out, to our own empathy. Account for positionality and intersectionality, subgroup segmentations. Call out the West Splainers. I probably don't need to tell you their names who have no training. No fake accounts. Report unsourced news. Be aware of conspiracies. All of this helps. Contemporary Ukrainian studies today is anchored against the Kremlin's active denial of modern Ukrainian history and the active denial of Ukrainian contemporary agency, the ability of people through elections to choose political candidates. When I measure those I've reached about Ukraine by the numbers, I am simply proud. And I've done none of it alone. 10 million in reach, 85 countries, all the archived evidence on intervals every three, four, six hours, 50,000 tweets, 100,000 likes, which are often not likes, and now nearing 10,000 threads. I've done this with the help of everyone who's contributed to the podcasts and to the archives. The podcasts are now on New Books Network with 120 channels, 5 million monthly downloads, and five, five to 6,000 listeners per episode, thanks to Marshall Poe. But I think just in parting that we academics have to show our emotions somehow. Otherwise, no one will respond to us, much less read us. Prestige institutions won't fix us with their corporate wellness plans. So please point to Ukrainian voices, but stop asking us who are screaming already to do everything. The sirens haven't stopped. Yes, I can do more, and I will do more to the best of my ability. We especially need more books, more writers, more lectures, and more attention to one of the best fields, I think, which is out there in the world today, that which I call Ukrainian studies. I'm one voice, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, so many things that we could talk about. Um, so many important things that you're uh, focused on. Um, so much emotion uh, in your discussion, which I appreciate. Uh, I recognize, although I don't have the kinds of personal connections that you do, uh, but I appreciate that you bring that emotion to us today and share it with us. Um, I want to ask you, uh, well, I have so many different questions. I want to start with this one. Um, toward the end of your talk, you talked about the power of democracy uh, and the power of the plurality of voice, and that this is stronger than dictatorship. Um, and it definitely seems that Vladimir Putin is banking on quite the opposite to be true, uh, that authoritarianisms can outlast because they're not responsible to their publics. Uh, I know you have seen, because I've seen you share the videos of people on Russian television talking about how much they can't wait for upcoming elections in the United States or elsewhere, because that will be the turning point. Uh, and so I kind of, I'm hoping maybe you can just say a couple of words about why you think democracy and the plurality of voice is stronger than dictatorship and why in this case, um, Putin is wrong. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think, um, Steve, that's an excellent question. I, I, I would answer it in two ways, bo both in terms of media contexts. So the, the first media context, as, as many have noted, who have been following Russian television, Simonian, Solovyov, um, Kremlin TV, what, what really was RT or RT Today, I, I really think um, if you watch the clips that are sent around by Julia Davis and Francis Scar and, and those who I think must have to detoxify at the end of each day, the, the propaganda war has been lost. I, I think that's a very fair statement to make at this point. 
it has very little resonance. It had demographics in, in Russia among, I would say, a 50 and older, or maybe even a 60 and older um, Sovok type crowd. I, I don't think that the propaganda machine will win. And in fact, watching the, the Gerbelsian aspect of this, thinking about like Fran Hirsch's book on Nuremberg, I, I think that I think that the war the war criminals pretty much know that they've had to double and triple down on the message as as it's been signaled to them in one capacity or another from the Kremlin. The second point I would make more directly about democracy is that while while Putin Evan as a KGB and FSB man um, coming out of his world of, of statecraft in the 1980s saw democracy as as a weakness. I think this is a, a very bad strategic miscalculation. Um, and in some ways, the, the appeasement um, ha has caused a lot of this to the point where one, one can influence campaigns or perhaps even by politicians. Um, the most notorious case, I would say, in, in terms of the policy world is Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. The ability to use German space as, as a sort of like object for targeting. Um, but again, I, I think that the turnaround in the security structure has has been so significant to the point where the Swedes and Finns have joined NATO and the Germans are actually sending weapons um, in defense of their values. And I think that's really the key word here. It's not ethics, but values as as, as it used to be called in the Republican Party, from you know Nixon on forward, the, the values voters. Um, it, it's the values voters, not not just like in a blue state or red state environment, who are really taking to the streets and expressing their solidarity with Ukraine as a matter of course. So, you know, Ukrainian information and counter disinformation, you can call it propaganda if you want. I think has been really highly effective. At, under, at underscoring the nature of democratic values. The, the actual like truth of the matter being that countries which have open and fair and free elections governed by the rule of law are much stronger than those that aren't. Thank you, Stephen. Um, can I ask you a little bit more about um, how you think about your February 24th archive? Um, you described it in your talk as a work of art um, of course, we as historians think of archives uh, in a utilitarian fashion. They're the place we go to learn history, to research history. I have a lot of my students this week um, have asked questions about um, how you as a historian approach this concept of the February 24th archive. And I want to ask one of them. Amanda Young says, how do you think the online nature of this war will affect future historians' attempts to understand? How can historians of the modern era deal with the overwhelming amount of information present in tweets and memes and TikTok and so forth, the tens of thousands of, of uh, items in your archive? Uh, so as you work to, to preserve, she goes on, as you work to preserve online records for future study, how do you reconcile your personal biases with the need to preserve varying viewpoints? So I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on this archive, how you see this archive in relationship to your identity as historian. Yeah, that's great. I, I love that question. And, and uh, thank you, Amanda, because I think the subjectivity of archives is something I've been preoccupied with for many years in my own scholarship and research and, and writing. Um, also, because I'm preoccupied with the prejudices and subjectivities and biases of maps, this is the corollary to all of that. So I, I would answer this it, it, as a scholar, if I can put on my scholarly hat. First, by saying, you know, read Ann Laura Stoller and Kate Brown. Um, read gendered critiques of, of the historical profession. I remember Bonnie Smith um, reading the importance of, of thinking about archives as a form of passion and desire. Um, and, and I guess this is something that I tried more or less as an experiment. Um, I remember Willard Sunderland, when he reviewed my book, um, he, he said something really interesting about maps being 
cold in the archive and hot when you're actually um, seeing them and, and sort of dealing with them? How do you actually sort of like breathe life into them again? This is how I think about the gathering of information, because obviously the gatherer is not neutral and the information is not neutral. So why should we pretend that we are neutral? Um, I, I, you know, I, I take greater inspiration actually from Holocaust historians and Holocaust archivists. I, I mentioned um, Ringelblum, for instance, Emmanuel Ringel, Ringelblum. He's one of my inspirations for the archive. Um, I imagine doing this as, as an intersection of Jewish history and Ukrainian history in a transnational capacity. Um, I never thought actually that I would limit it to uh, a language. Um, I did my research and writing in multiple languages, eight languages, I think, maybe 10 languages. So my, my approach, you know, it is polyphonic, but that doesn't really capture quite the essence of, of, of including multiple voices and then trying to get to the undercurrents of their moods. Um, so, you know, like a lot of the a lot of, a lot of the threads that I've cataloged and will eventually sort into cat into categories are very flat. They're they're monotone and they're monochromatic because they're written by analysts who are going to give us cool, kind of cold, sobering perspective. I, I guess I'm much more drawn to the emotions of this. Um, and I, I, I think that there's a generational point to be made finally about this. But you know, those who are using memes tend to be in their 20s and younger, whereas the senior scholars, the kind of like old, old you know, middle-aged to senior scholars are the ones offering the position papers in foreign affairs or in, in one of the one of the Tostia Journali. So I think actually it's just a matter of data set collecting. And then there will be people who say, well, Siegel leaned this way. He must have, he must have been, you know, and, and more antagonistic toward Russian trolls that wasn't very interested in that. I think all of that will be found eventually. And pro probably I'm blinded to half of the biases and prejudices that I have. Can you um, follow? You you mentioned this uh, to a degree in um, your talk, but I, I was hoping maybe you could talk about it just a little bit more. Melissa Smurs, uh, also in my class, asks um, about information that you don't allow to be posted in your archive. Yes, uh, and you did talk about that a bit, but I was wondering if you could expand on it. And she asks also in in this relation in this regard, do you envision any of the contents, for example, digital photographs, recordings, etc being used for future war crimes investigations. And that's where I wanna ask mm -hmm. your question about the things that I know from having read you over the last six months, seven months, uh, I know the things where you have drawn a line and said you will not post. Um, but there is this other question of the need to preserve historical yeah. evidence. And so I was just wondering where you fall in relation to that. And obviously there's a much bigger world of other people who are doing these kinds of investigations, but if you could just kind of reflect on that for us a little bit. Sure. I, I mean, a lot of the investigations are, are um, ongoing, so I, I don't want to disclose too much in that re in regard, but I can say a couple of general remarks. Um, I, I did watch, you know, the ICJ and Human Rights Watch and, and some other um, organizations. I, I'll talk about amnesty separately, but um, you know, international human rights organizations are the world from which I came when I was a graduate student. I remember um, watching very carefully in the 1990s as a graduate student at Brown, people who were who were doing um, human rights watch investigations of, of rape victims in Bosnia and and like cataloging the atrocities. And it it was it was with the goal in the kind of era before the internet of prosecution, right? Um, I, and, and I think that the technology has, has evolved to the point where people can just upload TikTok videos. Um, that's very helpful as, as the people who've created the war portals have pointed out. Um, there are multiple journalists who, who have been um, working on the military fronts. Um, you know, um, Natalia Humenyuk, who's been with Operation Group South, is just absolutely excellent. Um, Maria Avdieva, who's been in Kharkiv I, for almost the entire war, uh, taking trips out to Saltivka. Um, these, are, these are people who really know what they're doing. And, 
you know, Amnesty had sent delegations of, of EOD weapons inspectors um, after the siege of Kiev. They were also collecting materials, working with Ilya Ponomarenko. Um, Amnesty has is, is kind of fallen apart because they refuse to listen to you, actually Ukrainian journalists um, on the ground in developing their, their reports. And I think that's very problematic. But I'll just say as a general rule, the things that I, I won't share are POW videos. I'm, I'm inflexible about that. I, I don't think it's right um, because the, the POWs are, are humans, they're people, they have families, their faces can go through any kind of visual recognition technology. Um, and, and I abide by the Geneva Conventions um, in cataloging those um, war crimes. I, I actually take those international laws, despite the fact that the Kremlin is violating the post-1945 order very seriously. Um, and I'll just say as a kind of footnote to this, journalists are extraordinarily good at their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Why do their jobs for them? Uh, you know, as a historian of the Gulag, you, you know this, but you've seen the reports from the New York Times and Washington Post on the filtration camps, on Bucha. I don't, I stay out of their way. I don't tell them what to do and they don't tell me what to do. And in exchange, we we just have a community and we we build references between each other when we need each other's help. I, I think that's, it's not false modesty. It's, it's actually understanding the need for digital um, infrastructure and, and also the, the sort of level of modesty and, and humility and privacy that has to go with um, this very sensitive process. That's really enlightening, Stephen. Thank you. Um, there's a, a student here at George Mason uh, who's in the audience, Pearl Matiba, uh, who asks um, a couple of questions. Uh, and um, one is uh, your view on Africa's response to the war. Uh, so uh, Pearl is, is originally from Africa, um, I know, uh, and and has done journalistic work there. Um, and one one of the reasons that I want to bring her question to your attention is that some, when they talk about the information war, say that Ukraine has won the information war with Western Europe and the United States, but have lost the information war with the global South. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could just sort of reflect on that um, uh, a little bit. Uh, from from what you've seen, yeah, I, I think I think that's a very complicated question, and there there isn't there isn't a conclusive answer to that yet. So, let let me say a couple of things. The Ukrainian first, the Ukrainian journalists who are loudest on Twitter, because I spend most of my time on Twitter. I mean, Nika uh, Milkozyorova, who's who's um, very good, you know, now she's in New York. Maxim Aristavi, who's originally from Zaporizhia. Um, Olga Tokaryuk, who's also quite excellent. Um, you know, I mean, many of them are, are now um, reaching out, uh, let's say, trying to create solidarity networks. There, there are separate kind of leftist solidarity networks, I think, that have been somewhat successful. Taras Bilyus, who is, is a Ukrainian leftist who's actually serving in the military on the front, has been pretty successful at, at kind of raising awareness and consciousness. So, you know, I, it, it, this is not this is not to say that there is a, a lack of solidarity. Um, I've seen in South Africa, for instance, demonstrations. There are photos that often go around on Flash or Nyekta. Uh, demonstrations in, in Durban, for instance, I, I saw recently. But, you know, there is a point to be had here because a lot of the think tanks in D.C., like the Quincy Institute or Responsible Statecraft, those, those who were either pro-Kremlin or pro-Putin or who, who didn't like the idea of further supporting the U.S. military industrial complex, a, a lot of them have, you know, seriously considered just neutrality or peace or getting out of this war as fast as they can. Um, so I, I don't I don't exactly think that Ukrainians have won that information war yet. Um, I I think the solution to this, if if I'm going to be pro-Ukrainian, which of course I am, is to to do what was once done in the Soviet Union, to invite delegations of journalists to come and, and create communities to, to study at the journalism schools like in Kiev, 
um, spend some time actually visiting cities other than Kiev, maybe developing the programs. I know that the Kiev School of Economics is a master's program and they're trying even during the war to, to continue this. So it, it, I think as a project for future solidarity, there's a lot of work left to be had, but I, do, I don't think that the think tank universe is a good barometer, if you will, for measuring the, the, the success or failure of the information war. There are psyops, there's information and disinformation and counter disinformation. But I think that the building of, of truth and reconciliation, or at least truth, reconciliation, solidarity is, is probably going to take a lot of time. Um, I've watched African student, um, in fact, a Professor uh, Nana Oseo Pare and I are involved with Reese Think Tank. Um, you know, the, the project, Amaryllis's project for, for ACs in which uh, my students are actually going to be presenting about race during the war, focusing on Nigeria and a couple of other countries. You know, I don't think there's, in, there's any reason for us to deny the discrimination that um, non-white, for lack of a better word, students um, have faced in Ukraine, international students in Kharkiv, Lviv, um, trying really to, to get some form of justice to continue their studies. Um, I continue to reach out to a lot of these groups privately. And, and I think if you're interested, you can certainly message me and, and I, I'd be willing to connect you. Um, but my way of answering this question is, is that it, there's work to be done. This, this is a Shtodielat question rather than a Ktovinovat question. Um, I, I, I see that as, as something that the Ukrainian government is going, what the Ukrainian government will have to work on, not to mention its higher education networks. So we have a couple of questions from colleagues uh, in the historical profession, one from Kiev, one from British Columbia. Uh, Martin Kiesley uh, from Kiev writes, from your point of view, what is the future of Russian studies and where is an appropriate place for Ukrainian studies in academia? And similarly, Wilson Bell writes, um, asking about where you see Ukrainian studies within ACES, within hmm. the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, yeah. He says, now 222 days into your archive, if there was not much of a shift in 2014, has there been a shift since February? Hi, Wilson. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Will, Wilson and I are, are following each other on Twitter for a long time. Um, I, I think the moment for centering Ukrainian studies is now. I, I really do. Um, it, it's It's been a long time coming, um, I, and I'm not going to make too many apologies, apologies for that, but I actually do think that Ukrainian studies needs to be framed within post-colonial studies and decolonial studies. So I think to you know to account for the diversity of peoples in Ukrainian history, all the empires, all the nations, all the movements, all the wars, I, I think that that's the best way of, of framing this, not simply getting trapped in the modern Ukrainian history since 1848. I know Tim Snyder is, is doing a lecture series um, covering some of the earlier period, and, and that's great. There should be connections with Polish scholars, German scholars, Australian scholars. It is it is really a moment for global Ukrainian history and global Ukrainian studies, and there is a great demand for that. All the same, I think for the Russian studies field, I, I just think that Russian the Russian studies field really has to change. Um, I, I would actually support the idea of Russian scho Russian scholars learning Ukrainian. Um, I think it's perfectly fine for a mid-career scholar to learn a couple more languages. Um, it doesn't have to be Ukrainian. It, it could be Farsi or Arabic. But it, if you get stale, um, I, 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 I don't, I don't really appreciate that, um, to be honest. And you know, I, I'll say this as someone who wrote a third book and learned Hungarian for six years in order to write it. Um, I like people who are continually inquisitive. This includes all of the adult learners in the audience. And, and I admire, Steve, what you've done as a specialist in Russia and Kazakhstan and the Soviet Union, encouraging people to at least learn the Ukrainian names and know enough about Ukrainian history to be tested on it and carry it out into, into careers. That is an absolute start to all of this. So I, I support the idea of broadening expertise and broadening fields. 
um, in the Eurasian field as well, since I work in a Slavic and Eurasian studies department and a center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies with Ukrainian studies as a high priority. So let me tell you uh, this then. My daughter, uh, who is a sophomore at Harvard this year, uh, I think I surrounded her so much with Ukrainian film and literature and culture and all of this all over the, the course of the summer as I was preparing to teach this class and preparing for this series. She's actually taking Ukrainian at Harvard right That's now. Great. And I promised her uh, that if she took Ukrainian in the fall, uh, that in the spring, because this semester is a little nuts, um, that I would start working on learning it myself as well. Uh, so we'll we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm that intimidated at the thought of learning <laughs> a new yeah, language at this point in my life, but, that, uh, but I'll great. give it a go. That's great. And in, Tur in Turkic languages too, I mean, Central Asian languages, this is such a high priority, especially if, you know, more conflict and war erupts as it has between Az Armenia and Azerbaijan. We, we need the resources and experts to write books about this. So um, I, I strongly encourage you to continue. Yeah. The, I mean, there's tremendous challenges, of course, that go into a lot of this. Um, and I've thought about it a lot as, as many of my students here uh, you know, look toward what their future opportunities could be. Uh, and we struggle to continue to teach Russian here. Um, we fight semester after semester to make sure we have as many students as possible. Uh, and so it's difficult for us to conceive, I think, of offering other languages. Yeah. Uh, it's not something we've ruled out. It's, in fact, a conversation that we plan to have, but um, but it's difficult. Um, in this regard, then, let me ask you uh, this question. I'll make this our last one. So Paul Abishan is a, a student in the Russian Eurasian Studies program here. He writes, I'm a Russian language major uh, who's extremely interested in a career in humanitarianism and aid work. Uh, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for me? Cool. I love this question. And I, 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 um, yeah, I taught in Colorado for many years, um, 11 years, in fact, when out of graduate school. And I, I encourage students to get in to have three tracks. This is usually my speech. So the the ones, the one track that I would urge you to consider might, might be government work or USAID, something like that. I'm sure that there are resources that you can utilize it at George Mason. Another, another would be nonprofit work. So I've worked with NGOs really for um, almost all of my um, professional life. I think NGOs have certain problems when it comes to funding and, and sometimes in terms of politics and ideology, but to gain experience working for an NGO, I think is, is a very good training. Um, and the last thing I would just say is, is make sure that you don't neglect language, culture, and history. Language, culture, and history is, is the trilogy for all of us who emerged out of the area studies complexes, for better or worse. But the, the field for the centers in which we study and earn our master's degrees and, and PhDs are going to be in high demand. Um, whether or not Putin um, is there or not, I think it's going to be a, a high priority working with aid organizations. And, and if you like, working with organizations that are anti-corruption, tracing transparency and accountability. We want to know where all that Pentagon money is going in Ukraine um, <laughs> and, and elsewhere. So like the Ukrainians are not lily white in this situation either. We absolutely, we absolutely must, based on past precedent and experience, use our knowledge and language, history, culture, policy, and so forth to, to track that. Uh, so. I, I would encourage you to consider all of these options. Stephen, I can't possibly thank you enough, not only for coming to talk to us today, uh, but for your literally tireless work. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night, unable to sleep, and alas, who has been up and tweeting, uh, but Stephen Siegel. Uh, and uh, I have learned so much uh, from following you. I think you are one of the people that has changed my thinking uh, about what my role is as an academic and as a historian. Uh, this series actually owes a lot um, to you uh, and to people like you. Um, so uh, a couple of things uh, for the audience. Next week, uh, we have Marcy Shore uh, from Yale University. She's absolutely brilliant. Was one of my uh, grad school colleagues uh, many years ago at Stanford. Uh, she wrote an absolutely gorgeous book called The Ukrainian Night, 
uh, about the, the Maidan revolution, the revolution of dignity, as Ukrainians call it in 2013, 2014. She's going to talk about um, what it's like to look back at that eight years later. Please do remember that we will be starting at 3.30 next Monday rather than 3. Uh, this is to accommodate her teaching schedule. Her students need her uh, as well as we do. Uh, beyond that, um, I did put in the chat, um, Stephen uh, is so incredibly knowledgeable and mentioned so many names of things to read and people to follow. And I promise you that I will go through the video uh, and I'm going to try to compile as many of those as I can for you. Uh, for my classes, I'll send them to you for the public audience. I will put that on Twitter. For all of y'all, include it in an email that I'll send to, to all of you this week uh, to try to share with you some of the, the people that you can read and that you can follow uh, and that you can think about. Uh, last thing, then, uh, we have our Q&A session on Friday at 3.00. Uh, you can go to rest.gmu.edu, rest.gmu.edu, uh, to find more information about that. Uh, and please do come and join us at 2 p.m. in Lafayette Square uh, in Washington, D.C., outside the White House on Saturday. Uh, and um, with that, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, so great to have so many of you here with us today. Thank you very much, Stephen.